for it. Have, take every opportunity we can for um, grant funding that can help decrease the cost of this project. It's roughly 42,000 square feet of impacted space. Um, half of that is new construction, which will be um, the new, the new um, two-story addition off the front of the hospital. Um, and then the other half is renovating ex existing space. So when you come across, when you come to the hospital, um, what, and we're still working on this, these designs, of course, and the details, but basically think of a, a new curb appeal, new, new um, addition off the front. Our ED will expand to accommodate more exam rooms, um, expanding out into our ambulance bay. Um, and that's all in detailed uh, design work that we're working with our, um, our owner's rep, um, Steve Horton, who's here tonight. Um, that helped us go through all these projects. He's done multiple hospital and healthcare projects. So um, there's much work to do um, uh, moving forward, and we really want to get to the point where we're shovel ready. And as, as Frank shared, it's a matter of we move on this project when we're ready to and the environment's right, uh, meaning we can get the supply, the labor, material, um, and the, the markets in a good space. So we have a period of roughly four years um, once, because of sort of the need to, to break ground on this. Um, to, to illustrate the need for the, 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 this addition, uh, I'll just point out one last thing. Dartmouth um, is building a new patient tower, finishing up a new patient tower, and they're doing that because their infrastructure that they're moving away from is 30 years old. We're moving from infrastructure that's 50 years old. So we've been really good with our resources, and extending the life of that, but as Frank um, did share, the environment in which we provide care continues to change and we need to adapt with that. So, <coughs> thank you. So I'll just give you a general timeline understanding is, is how both Brian and, and Frank have pointed out that things are always in motion. Um, so it's not written in stone, but in general, um, as Brian pointed out, we're going after as many grant opportunities as we can to help manage the costs of this project. So the grant application process that starts tonight with our public hearing, this grant application will go in by September 13th, and that starts our process. There are a number of grants that we're looking at that we'll be going after in the next year, year and a half, um, as well as new market tax credits that we'll be looking at. Construction is proposed around sometime in 2023, but again, that could shift, um, and potentially completed in 2025, but again, that could shift, um, just with everything that's happening. We didn't expect a pandemic in the middle of everything we had in the last few years. So with that information said, um, we'd like to open this up for questions first from the council, and uh, then from our general uh, public here. Um, when you said the state of Buddha, are you referencing the Green Mountain Care Board? Are they the ones that are, okay, so when you said the state, it's actually the, 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 yeah, because I was in the back of my mind, have they, yeah, they, they because are, I know how they could be tough, and I didn't know if they had yeah. approved the project or yeah. not yet, so yeah. okay. They're, they're Thank the gold standard. That significance. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they're the gold standard, and we will be quoting that in every grant application because that shows the need. If right. they've approved no, that it, was, that shows the need. I had made a note even before tonight to, to yeah. see yeah. About that. Excellent. And then um, the one million CDBG that you're starting tonight, the process, that actually comes to the city and we oversee it? Or? Uh, yep, yeah. so written in statute for community development block grants, the applicants must be the municipalities. So the applicant will be the city, the money comes in for use toward this project. Um, the match does not come from the city for that, that will come out of the overall structure of the financing that we have um, for this project. That was so. my, that was my <laughs> other thing. Okay. Um, Not to worry. No, that's all I had, those are the two things. Question? Mm -hmm. The only question I had, and if you could just answer it was, are we on the hook for any, uh, you know, for uh, any match? Right? And no, no. That, the match will come forth with the other financing uh, that will come in for this project. Mm -hmm. What are the odds that it'll be approved? It's, it will be a competitive project. Okay. It'll be a it'll be a competitive project for sure, especially up in this area. Does that go through 
the health board in Vermont? No, the CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant, will go through the Vermont Community um, Planning the planning Program, Development Planning Program. So that that will go before their board in, I believe it's November. Okay. Submit September, November. We should hear sometime early winter. Um, is the life of the grant for this coincide with the life of the CLM? Close. The life of this grant will be three years. Okay. So there will be overlap. As with all grants, for good reason, there's a potential for extension. Mm -hmm. um, but there's possibility, the way we would look at this, is using the grant for pieces of this uh, project that would finish within that three-year period. I can't even remember about these grants. Is it a reimbursement or is it they give you the money? Reimbursement. Reimbursement. So you got to spend it and reimburse it. Yeah, my answer. I just thought of another question. I just, my mind is always the Northern Borders grant. When are you applying? I'm just curious because the hospital can apply directly. We don't have to apply. Correct? No. That's the hospital, correct. That's different. They yeah. can apply. Okay. Yeah. And that would be later. In the early spring, that's usually around March. The reason I was asking is we still have an open one, right? With the because of COVID, everything got delayed. Yeah. So I was, well, I was yeah. wondering about that. No, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, most of the other grants will be applications directly by the hospital, by the hospital. Um, but the way that the CDBGs are written, it's a municipally uh, municipality must apply for. <clears throat> Can I just make a comment? Sure. So, um, three years in planning is good, you know. Um, but I just, for reassurance that this, uh, for me, sitting from the years I was on the board, that it, it isn't a fly by night, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Let's get fancy like everybody else. Um, we had started looking at renovating and doing things more than three years ago, yeah. and but didn't move on things. We were still looking and planning and doing things, and then it really came to fruition, and actually, COVID actually, I do believe, brought out some things that actually needed to be looked at and changed and, <coughs> and certainly brought about the need for private rooms. Not only is it nice, um, for health reasons, it really brought out the fact that private rooms are really pretty necessary. So. Besides all the other stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody open it up? Yeah, open it. Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry for my time, because I don't realize there's all the feelings that's sick, but um, so you're applying for community block grant from MBG from whom? From, uh, it's the BCDP, the Vermont Community Development Program. It's a state program. Mr. Mayor, for how much? One million. For one million dollars. One million, period. Any for an addition at the hospital? Mr. Mayor, what's the addition going to be used for? Do you want, would somebody like to address the addition? And the addition is a two-story addition up the front of the hospital to include inpatient care, um, relocation of our lab, expansion of the ED, exam rooms, and a relocation of our rehab services department. And, Mr. Mayor, what's going to happen with the existing space? Or? What, what, Mr. Mayor, what's going to happen? Mayor? Yeah, just I can ask what, you. What, what's the, what, what's going to happen with the existing space? You say you're going to be rehab. Okay, the ED, I'm sorry? No. Rehab gets moved to where the, the med surge currently is, so we use that space. The med the surge? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, the rest of it's new addition. Lab gets relocated into the new addition. The lab space will be turned into conference space um, for public use. Yeah. And the ED expands into the existing ambulance bay. Are space. you going to lose any, can any, um, Parking spaces or anything I use or do you need additional parking? Well we're we're still working on on that design, but because the addition is coming out the front, it's it's uh, very conceivable that we will lose some parking. How many? I don't I don't know yet. Yeah. But we also have parking in the east lot, so it's all connected there um, out the front. So. And are you gonna are you gonna be that two fifty for this? Are you, where are you with the permit process? We're we're as just as we've applied with the CON for that, we're also in the middle of the Act 250 as well. And this, and um, this, so the community block grant—that's federal money. It is. It is okay. federal money. 
And I put, just so that you know what you have the, on page four of the five pages, I put a brief description of each of the areas um, that will be part of the renovation and, and construction of the hospital, just because that'll help for sure. Okay. But, yeah. And you, you're Karen, right? I'm Karen. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Good to see you, Chris. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm just curious, about how much money are you predicting the, um, the project as a whole will cost? This grant is only for a million. I'm sure you're talking about more than yeah, a million. It's, it's in the neighborhood of 25 to 28 million in today's dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. right. So. And the second thing is, this is a block grant of, that the city is applying for from a certain agency. Does this in any way um, uh, harm us if we're seeking to apply for some other reason for um, monies from that same uh, agency that you're talking about? In other words, are we in competition uh, for monies that we might want for some other reason? So right now, this is the only community development block grant before the city for the September 13th round of funding. Um, so there are no other projects that that you would be competing against. Um, it is a competitive process against projects elsewhere in the state, um, but the municipality right now is applying, has in front of it this project for the September 13th round. There will be future rounds. This is a state grant? Or? I'm, I'm sorry. It's a state grant. State grant. Other questions? questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, as your representative, I sit on the, on the health care committee, and I know that the president, Brian Noll, and Frank Noll, have uh, presented this plan, as I recall, to a, a high member of, of our health care committee. He's also presented it to the uh, Fremont Care Board. And, um, I missed a little bit probably early on in the cover, but uh, from everything that I've heard by sitting on the, on the health care committee, that everybody seems to be favorable for this, uh, this proposal. Great, thank you. Other comments, <coughs> questions? Yeah, I do and have one. When we, when we read this, it was in uh, Caledonia. And then the other ones in the Caledonia. Uh, it, when I buy my Newport paper every day, there's more of those sold than for this area, Caledonia. I just want to, how come it wasn't in ours? So the reason that was put in the Caledonian paper is because the hospital serves the greater area of not only Orleans County, not just Newport, but Orleans County and Northern Essex County as well. Um, and so that paper extends yeah. more broadly. Good answer. Thank you. Anything else? So this is the 50th year of the hospital, correct? It is. Because I can remember, well, I, was, I lived in that neighborhood for so long, being 12 years old when it opened. This is the <laughs> so new, you're my this age is now. The, the new hospital. <laughs> the new, yeah, yeah new the new hospital. Right, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. 50 years to show. We built things that last. That's right. Because our old hospital still stands. <laughs> and as Brian mentioned, for our community and the communities around us, we're very fortunate to have a hospital in our area, in our direct area. And we're fortunate to have a hospital that's willing to do the work and the planning over time to keep investing and upgrading the services that are needed by our communities. So I know when people want to move, they look at the health care, the education system. Yeah. Those are like the top priority, uh, top things they look at when they look to move to a community. Yeah. So, anything else for anyone? Can I just add one more comment? Yep. Um, as, as you know, you learn about health care and what it takes to, um, to operate hospitals. Um, our hospital, short term, is struggling financially, um, but that doesn't impact this long term project because we have a strong balance, balance portfolio. And so, um, as you hear what's going on in, in the state of affairs for hospitals across the, 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 um, the state, um, we're, we're in that with, with everybody else. We are impacted by the inflation and everything else, but that doesn't 
we're, we don't we can't lose track of what this long term need is. This is a short term um, um, condition, and so we'll be you'll be hearing you know probably you know um, about us working through those things. But as far as this project is solid, it's a it's a need, and um, the hospital's been here for 100 years, and we're going to continue to make sure that that's the case. So just wanted to comment. On that. Great. Anything else? Then I guess. If not, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you very much, p.m. All members of the council are present. Others include Laura Dogan, city manager, and James Johnson, our city clerk treasurer. The next item is to approve the minutes of August 1st, 2022. I believe there is one correction. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we approve the minutes of 1 August 2022 with one uh, name change and uh, new business. We had a case where they had Mr. Charbonneau move to approve uh, events for Eden Ice, and he also seconded it, but that wasn't the case. It was Mr. Vachon that seconded it, so with the one correction, I make a motion to accept the minutes. So a motion made to accept the minutes with the one correction. Is there a second? Second. Made by Mr. Wilson, seconded by Mr. Vachon. Discussion on the minutes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next item is comments by members of the public. Um, I don't believe anyone had signed up. And so, Mr. Wilson, you said you had something. I'm a member of the public also, and I live in Newport. Um, <laughs> there's a minor error tonight. Uh, and when I saw it, and I said, when we got our paperwork, this said 6.30 for the council meeting. But this paperwork that we got says 6 o'clock for the public hearing. So I came in this morning and got with the city manager and he says, uh, something's not jiving here. But I said, if this is going at six, uh, at least let the council members know so they could be here for that portion of the public hearing. So we're gonna vote on a million dollar bond here, or whatever, uh, might be a good idea to have them here. So she did send that out, but uh, I guess we forgot about sending it out to the press, but uh, there was a mistake partially corrected this morning. So that's it in a nutshell. It didn't reach us. I have this with I don't six thirty meeting. No, it didn't reach uh, this desk until it was uh, about nine thirty I guess. Well that's why I came to flattering in yeah. after well, six. There was a mistake made and, and we tried to correct what we could in a hurry. Yeah. Um, does anyone care to hear what might have been missed during the beginning of the public? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Karen, if you want to just kind of repeat. So this uh, community development block grant is an application uh, for the renovation and construction project at North Country Hospital. Uh, the application will be for a million dollars and I'll just go briefly through each section. Uh, the Community Development Block Grant is applied for by the municipality. Uh, that's written in state statute. They must be the applicant. There's a process by which of information and project development that happens before it gets to this point. Um, but once it's ready then to go public with information, that's what we're doing tonight, to get public feedback on the project and on any potential impacts of the project that the public would like to weigh in on. 
So this particular project um, will take place over at North Country Hospital. Um, the proposed project is necessary to enhance really the 50-year-old care environments of the hospital. And it will be a combination of renovations of existing space and in addition to construction of a two-story section um, to the hospital for additional space. The Board of Trustees at North Country Hospital um, have been very proactive in their facility master planning over a number of years. As Melissa mentioned, it's not just a couple of years. They've been doing this over a number of years. And this particular project has been identified as a high need project, the highest of need. Um, COVID certainly showed a number of things that many of us didn't know before uh, and sort of informed the project and some of the design elements of the project. Um, a description, so the primary focus of the new addition and renovations is to consolidate and improve the present multi-floor inpatient department, provide a larger lab department area, and expand the emergency department. They all, these are all areas that have existing constraints. Um, there will be approximately a new additions about 20,198 square feet. And the renovations of the interior will be about 22,000 square feet, give or take a foot or two. For the inpatient department, uh, the goal is to improve the patient staffing model, infection control, and patient experience by consolidating the inpatient beds to a single floor and put most of the patient beds into private rooms. Brian described that quite in detail. For the lab department, uh, as Brian explained, instead of having to go through the hospital and into a lower area, uh, North Country Hospital would like to improve the present condition of the lab department by creating a new addition of 4,097 square feet. It will improve the workflow, efficiencies, the functionality, and patient and staff access to the lab. So that will essentially be a redesign. The emergency department, uh, the hospital would like to improve the department by renovating the current ambulance garage into additional emergency department exam rooms, which will approximately add 1,500 square feet to the emergency department. That will allow for additional capacity. Again, it will improve workflow efficiency. Uh, it will improve patient safety, uh, and it will improve the patient experience. The OTPT and ST departments, as you know, if you've been over there, are off campus at the moment. Those will be, those are currently housed separately, but they will be brought into um, the existing facility. And this will improve access of service to various hospital departments, such as inpatient PT and OT. It'll provide for a consolidated and updated department of about 8,600 feet, square feet. And then access, canopies, and other. So the exterior and the access to the hospital. A new front entry, lobby, and reception area will improve patient and visitor arrival. Front entry, lobby, and reception area will be a centralized check-in and provide greater security and controls. There will be new entry canopies for the front entrance and the emergency department for visitors and patients. And a new 656 square foot emergency department corridor addition will be added to allow for flow to direct access from the main lobby to the emergency department area. The plans also include new air handling units for the surgical area and new roof replacement for the proposed renovated lab area. So the projected costs as of this moment are about $25,369,670. Uh, those will those will likely change um, but the community uh, but the hospital is looking at a number of financing structures including a number of grants that they're going for in addition to new market market tax credits the balance that is remaining after grants have been exhausted will be uh, loans and equity that the hospital will put into the uh, structure the timeline We'll start essentially with the application of this grant on September 13th. We'll get that in. Proposed construction to start around July 2023, again subject to change. Uh, and the construction is proposed to be completed in September of 2025. That is in essence the overview of what we have. Is there anything I missed that you recall? No? 
I have a question. Any inpatient, increased inpatient capacity at the Bureau The number of beds, as I understand it, will remain the same. The capacity will remain the same, but there will be efficiencies due to the way it's laid out that will improve uh, both services and staffing, uh, as well as infection control for inpatient services. So no additional inpatient stay capacity. Correct. Karen, I can address that. Um, it's a critical you care. My question. Oh, but oh, it's a critical care hospital right. designation. They're limited to 25 inpatient beds. Yes, I understand. Yeah. So no additional stay. No addition. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Uh, limited uh, to 25 beds by whom? By Pepire or the state or federal it's state? It's a critical. It's, 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 it's medicine by definition. It. It's critical right. care. And it's what? It's, 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 well, in critical, it's the, actually it's federal. And it's, federal, it's federal. And because we're a rural hospital, it's we are limited to the number of beds we can serve, but it also affects the, the finance structure of charges and things, which is beyond my scope at this point to talk about fee structure because I'm not on the board anymore. But it's um, it's it's limited to 25 beds. And you got to remember, like was, which was said earlier. The goal of hospitals, unlike 20 years ago or 30, 40 years ago, is to get you in and out. You're, you're better. You're better off recovering at home when you can than you know being in the hospital. Um, and so that is the goal of every hospital in the country now. Is basically that you go in, whatever, and, they, and then they get you out as quick as they can. Can I ask Karen a question? Um, is there any thought of um, how the outbuildings right now might be repurposed? Yes. Um, that's not in a particular, in this particular presentation, um, but I can certainly get you that information. But the question was the additional buildings at the hospital, for example, that would be incorporated, the services incorporated in the hospital, those buildings will be used for other purposes, offices and so forth. Yeah. Maybe not housing? I have not seen housing. You would have to ask Brian. Can I ask Karen questions? Yes. As this hospital currently is losing specialists, they're leaving in droves, either voluntarily or because of financial reasons. Is this plan going to include increasing specialties? Because it's a long way to go to the Dartmouth Edge for an eye exam. It is. And as with many rural hospitals, as a critical care hospital, mm -hmm. it's it's meant to address an immediate need and then move to tertiary structures such as Dartmouth and uh, Burlington. So we're spending $25 million not to increase services. Well, actually, it's not necessarily to increase services. It's to improve efficiencies. And as most hospitals are confronting the change <coughs> in uh, labor force, one of the goals that you would see in the Green Mountain Care Board review of the project is to look at how we create efficiencies that don't require the hiring of additional full-time people. Um, that is actually a goal uh, for maintaining our healthcare structure and maintaining our services. So there are things that can be done design-wise that actually improve efficiencies. Would transportation then be included in this so that people can actually get to the other hospitals? So that may be beyond the scope of the hospital. Right now we're looking at the structure of the building and the design of the building to improve efficiencies and patient safety and, and uh, infection control and so forth. Um, but certainly all of those, con all of those things contribute. Um, but whether they're part of the scope of this, that is not currently part of the scope of this particular project. And it's just curiosity on my own part. They're taking over the ambulance bays and turning them into rooms. Where are the ambulance going to go? Are they going to unload outside? No. <laughs> they have a design piece for that. And I, I do wish Steve were here, but no, they have that taken into consideration. Again, it's, it's really to improve, improve the flow and the design elements um, because of the needs that were different 50 years ago. Okay. But we can always get more information. No, it's a good question. For two years since COVID, they haven't used those ambulance days at all. They were using them for like isolation rooms. Yeah. 
hopefully they have canopies so when you're getting unloaded in a wheelchair, can't hit in that in the pouring rain for 10 minutes mm -hmm. trying to get it, get it to the hospital. <laughs> I know that. It'd be nice to have a canopy. <laughs> which if is that's a need. nice design, yeah. Yeah, no, because I know that's a, a need, personal uh, experience. And again, it's, it continues to be a work in progress. So um, we've, what we've outlined here tonight is the general direction, um, and things will adjust as, as circumstances dictate. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful investment in our community, for sure, um, and, and certainly needed over a long period of time. It's 50 so years old. And you 50 will, years. Eventually, you have to upgrade yeah. a facility. Okay. Ms. May, did I hear there are designs out there? They're currently working with an architect on designs. So there's no even um, um, sample or draft? I don't have any. We don't have any. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Okay, moving on. The next item is. I'm sorry, there needs to be a vote on that resolution to proceed. I thought that was mm -hmm. number yeah. four. We're doing number four we, now. We did, we're doing number four now. We just did comments, and so I was going to go and said we need the CDBG. Thank you. So following the agenda. Following the agenda. Um, just a second. Side, but the next is the to consider the application by the hospital for the CDBG application. Um, I'm not going to read this whole resolution, but basically, it's an official resolution um, that the city council will vote on and will pass to apply for the funds. And I did fill one out for you where it needed to be. It's yeah, here. You have that I, copy. Okay. Yes. It both approves the city to apply and to designate your authorized signer. Right. Mr. Wilson gave it to me. I haven't done anything with my papers. It's right here. This stuff. <clears throat> I knew I had it. Okay, so we need a motion um, to approve the city applying for the CDBG funds. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Bashan. Is there a second? A second. Second by Ms. Patterson. Discussion? Yeah, I'd just like to add one. There's not really a discussion. As I asked earlier, we're, there's no city match for any portion of it. This is strictly, we just have to be the middle people. In there. That's correct. The match, there is a match required for this grant, but that will come through the other financing for this project. That match will be met. So the city's not obligated for the match. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I have seen because my work is on the board.
It's okay if he just doesn't sign it. Yep, since he that's fine. He abstained, so it's okay. item number five is the garden and park environmental status presentation yes thank you um, i'd like to introduce uh, christine uh, Beeling, who is here from the environmental protection agency and i'm going to pull and you're welcome to sit my experience if you like but i'm going to pull up the powerpoint and try to share it uh remotely so bear with me please great so while um, laura does that um, I'm Chris Beeling. I work for the Environmental Protection Agency in something called our Brownfields Program. And our Brownfields Program is a, a program to work with communities like yourself all over the country, um, though I work only in the six New England states, um, to re redevelop contaminated properties or properties that might need a little bit of a boost um, before they can be redeveloped. Um, because they have contamination on the hazardous substances, pollutants, or contaminants. Um, it's so nice to meet Mike Welsh tonight, um, who I've never met in person in this crazy Zoom world. Uh, Dave Snedeker and Laura have been working uh, with us on this project. Um, so we are gonna talk specifically about Gardner Park and the trajectory that we got here tonight. I also wanted you to know um, Josh Stewart is on the line. Josh is our engineering consulting firm and he is here for any of the real nitty-gritty technical questions, if you have them. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give a, an overview of, of where we are, because it has been um, a very lengthy process. Uh, and when you see the dates, it'll be pretty obvious why we had some, uh, had some delays. So Laura, do you want to put the first slide up for the, the map? Um, I'm assuming that this is being shared remotely. Okay. So, um, for the folks who are online, uh, let us know if you don't see these slides. No, there are no slides right now. Did you say there's no slides? No slides. We can either, uh, yeah, we can give it a second or we can tell you where we are. We're on the slide with the, the second slide, Josh. So before I start, I want you to know that I, I actually got to go to Gardner Park today. The weather was certainly cooperative. So uh, thank you for hosting me on such a, a beautiful day. I have been to Newport many times before, but um, always nice to, to Not take such it. good weather. Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to go there. <laughs> but today certainly was a, a splendid day. I think we want to go there now. Josh? Yeah, All right, great. So um, Josh, you can hear Josh coming from above. Uh, Josh, you can chime in anytime you need to. Okay. So this, this is just a schematic that we use in our reports just to kind of set the stage for what we're talking about. Um, we were originally called in to do some work on the playground area and the playground redevelopment, uh, but the park uh, was the state of uh, Vermont asked us to look at the entire park. So um, hence the boundary that you see here. So please, I don't know the proper, if anyone wants to interrupt or query, you tell me how you want uh, to handle that. If someone while well, she's presenting has a question, just raise your hand. I think that would be the best thing that I can do. Thank you. All right. 
So you want to do studies to date? So if you look at the studies to date, some of these predate me, and Laura might be able to add in, um, but the studies go back to 2015, where we're talking about a phase two. Phase two means you have, you're doing a site assessment of the earth and the soils in the park. So that had started way back in 2015. You have a very comprehensive, comprehensive master plan that has some beautiful ideas on how to redevelop the park to create your recreation economy, which is what we are trying to support with the Brownfields redevelopment. And you certainly have some beautiful resources in which to, to do that. Um, I got involved with the third bullet. You can see the Northeastern Development Association, the NBDA Coalition Grant. That's Dave Snedeker and Irene Nagel. We have a competitive grant process at EPA, nationally competitive, that um, regional planning commissions, municipalities, and others can apply for. NBDA applied for what we call a coalition grant, which is a, a combination of many communities, mostly because you're a pretty rural part of the world. Newport is one of the communities that is a part of Dave's coalition grant. Uh, and that was back in, um, Dave won that grant, or NBDA won that grant in 2019. So at that point in time, they had $600,000 of funding, of which to do environmental assessments across the Northeast Kingdom. At that point in time, I believe Mike came in and talked about a grant that we had on the books, or the, the city had on the books, to do the playground redevelopment, that great picture you saw at the beginning. The Splash Park, um, an ADA compliant playground. Um, anything else I'm forgetting? Improvements to the um the skate shack, uh, main campus disability, sidewalk improvement, so a comprehensive project. Yeah. And in order to do that, in order to get your funding, you have to do an environmental assessment. It's part of the process. So nothing special, just you know, a step along the way, of which we know when you're applying for grants, many steps along the way. Um, we did a phase one, uh, which is, like I said, kind of a paper exercise. Who are the neighbors? Do you have you know, a nuclear power plant next door? You do have a wastewater treatment plant next door. You know, so that type of thing. Who are the neighbors and what are the impacts to the park? Um, based on that, we did a phase two assessment where, like I said, you put holes in the ground, you test soil, you test groundwater, and you see what you see. Um, one thing you'll learn about these, when you talk about brownfields redevelopment, you never just do one assessment. You always need to do a little bit more, right? There's what we call data gaps, and there's always data gaps. No matter the best laid plans of mice and men, always data gaps. So hence, data gap has come in, and that's where Josh comes on. So at that point in time, the grant funding ran out. There was no additional grant funding, but yet you still had your playground redevelopment work that needed to be completed. So EPA has a program called Targeted Brownfields Assessment, where it's not competitive. Uh, EPA, well, it's competitive in a different way. EPA has their own contractors, Josh on the line, who continued the assessments for you under a different mechanism, but basically just continues to the next step. A uh, different funding mechanism is really the bottom line. Um, this is where I talked about a little bit of um, delays in the, in the game, and I know, Mr. Mayor, you were concerned about some of those. Um, COVID happened, getting in and out of the state with the crew from New Hampshire happened, lab work being put on hold happened, so we had a lot of delays for a bit of time um, on this project as, as well as many others, just based on the world that fell apart in 2020. So we did a supplemental phase assessment in March 2021. We did another data gap assessment um, in January 2022, specifically looking at surficial soils on the ball field. Um, so like I said, the state asked us to expand the reach um, to the ball fields, and we did that. Um, we talked about what you can do to remediate what we found and the corrective action plan. So let's sc scope ahead. I kind of combined the results of all the assessments into one package so you didn't have to go assessment by assessment. So here's what we were talking about before. Your park is built on historic fill. There's a lot of debris, um, anything from car parts, bricks, concrete, ash, you know, and this is nothing against the town. This is just what happened 100 years ago, kind of, you know, just kind of a standard procedure. Um, so we have historic fill. We have subsurface, sub, subsurface soils, subsurface meaning below the top six inches, um, with contamination, groundwater contamination above regulatory standards. That means you have to do something. 
and then we have potential impacts from the wastewater treatment plant, the Newport car wash, and the mini mart. And it says four wrecks. I just wanted to say that I only have three bullets, but we broke out the wastewater treatment plant because that was a publicly owned building, as well as the mini mart and the car wash because that was a different, a different owned building. Next slide, Laura. Let me just flip to my notes to make sure I don't forget anything. All right, so here we go. So this is hard to see. We have all these documents online. We can share with you. Laura has them. Um, I have them. We can share anything that you need to see. They're all public information. Um, but this is just one of the schematics that talks about a couple things I wanted you to look at. You can see where it says, maybe you can't see, but <laughs> if you looked closely, you could see monitoring wells, which is exactly that, monitors the groundwater. The groundwater below the park's about five feet deep, so not very deep. And the reason for that is because you have a lake and you have a river right around your park. So groundwater is, is pretty high. Um, soil borings are exactly that. You go down into the soil, anywhere from 0 to 6 to 18 inches. Take samples and you see what you see. Um, and that has all been done. So here's the playground area you can see has really been looked at quite extensively. And the ballparks. Um, you can also see the groundwater flow is a little funky there because you have so much water. You have the lake on one side, the river, so it's not maybe as clear of a model as it might be. Well, it, was, it was basically filled in 1929. Right. And they began filling it. So it's a little bit complicated because yeah. of the fill. Um, but it just gives you an idea of what area has been assessed. Uh, OK, next slide, please, Lawrence. So what we did is we broke them down into what we call decision units. OK, so we did some deeper soil samplings. The state came back and said, uh-oh, but the, the the issue at a playground, right, is the topsoils, right? The soils that you're, you're playing in, right, that you're touching. So that's what we wanted to, to see. So we broke them into what we call decision units, one, two, three, four. One being decision unit one is the, the playground area as it stands. These are all ball fields, broken out kind of just on the boundaries of, of the ball fields. Um, and what we do in those parts is we do what they call composite samplings. It's a little bit of an efficiency method. You have 30 boxes, but you don't do 30 samples. You take little bits, and you combine them, and you kind of you know, do a, a machination with certain very formulaic uh, procedures, and you kind of figure out what's there. So what has um, become of that? We had some exceedance, exceedances for arsenic lead and some uh, what we call polyaromatic hydrocarbons, stuff from coal gasoline. Um, and then we had, um, we'll get that out a little bit more. I just want to point out we had a little bit of a quality control issue with this one. So next slide, Laura. We went back and we did it again, just to make sure that we did it properly, to make sure that that was a ball field two, to make sure that um, you know everything was up to standards and procedures. And again, it was a quality control issue that we wanted to double check. All right, so now, this is it, drum roll, next, next slide. This is what we found. So this is just a summary slide. And like I said, I have many, many, many data tables and others that we can, can share. Uh, and Josh has them at his fingertips, I think, back in the, uh, behind the curtain. But what we found is there's groundwater contamination. Nothing new. You've known that for seven, eight years. Um, it's containing arsenic and lead, very common contaminants in the state of Vermont. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons and naphthalene, mostly, again, from coal gasoline, you know, petroleum hydrocarbon type contaminations. Um, has everyone heard of PFAS, kind of the contaminate of the day? Mm -hmm. um, you do have very low levels of PFAS contamination there um, above actual limits for the state of Vermont. So groundwater has some impacts. But again, if you're talking about your park, what we're worried about are the soils, right? We're worried about where you're going to dig to renovate for the playground area and where kids are, are playing on the ball fields. Good news. We'll start with good news. Um, decision unit two, three, and four are below pro pro what we call project action limits based on Vermont standards. So no corrective action. Nothing needs to be done for current use. Don't go digging in the ball fields, OK? If you dig in the ball fields, you're going to have to deal with the soils. But if you just play ball in the ball fields and just leave them as is, you're good to go. And you've been cleared by the state of Vermont to just move forward. Also want to say Linda Preventure, who was our state of Vermont rep that's on vacation today, so that's why she couldn't join us. So um, just want to you know point that out that it wasn't because she didn't want to, she's just on vacation and it is vacation time. 
Um, okay, so this is the one we want to talk about. Playground area D1 has ex arsenic exceeding the pals in the superficial soils. So basically what ha that means is you have to have what we call a contaminant management plan, a soil management plan. You just can't dig and renovate at will. You have to do something with those contaminated soils. Um, and then we also had arsenic, PAHs, and lead in the subsurface soils, like I said, below, beneath most of the, most of the, the entire park area, which again is why we don't want to be digging in ball fields, right, when we play ball on your ball fields. All right, so that leads us to the next phase. Something has to be done before we can get to Mike's grant to renovate the park and make the Splash Park and you know work with the Recreation Committee to do what they want to do. Um, and this is a tough one, but this is just, this is just is, like I said, it's a process. This is what it is. The next part of the process is what we call the Evaluation of Correction Action and Alternatives, ECA. Uh, there's always a word in, in government speak. Um, but basically, you, pick, you look at alternatives. You know, do you dig up the whole park and start again and bring in clean soils? Probably not, too expensive. Do you do nothing? Probably not, because there's a health risk. What's the one in between that makes some sense? So if you're going to renovate and redevelop your playground, you're going to remove some of the soils, have to do something with them. You're going to put an, engine, an isolation barrier on, kind of like a liner type thing. You build your playground above that with clean soil, and you implement what we call institutional controls, which means you probably will take some monitoring well samples for time, and again, you're not going to be punching holes in that once it's done. Um, that's just kind of a very big picture brush uh, of what has been um, approved by the state in May 2020. The state has approved that. So the next stage, next step in the phase, uh, in the process, Laura, is the cap. Oh, well, so yeah, this one you want to look at really closely. So the corrective action plan. The corrective action plan says, OK, you have your three alternatives. Um, this is how we think we're going to implement that preferred alternative that is now under review for Laura, for Linda Preventure, and from us. But the one thing I wanted to pull out in there, which Laura has been very familiar with, is the costs. It's not cheap to do this. And it's probably around the $270,000 plus or minus we put a contingency in there um, in order to do that. And again, that is pre-doing any redevelopment of the playground. This is to get the site ready for redevelopment just from an environmental perspective. OK, so $300,000. Laura, next slide. This is what I was talking about, the corrective action plan. It was just submitted for a review to the state. It's still under review. It does assume that the playground will be redeveloped. Um, what we do at this point in time is Linda Preventure approves that. Uh, approve is really the wrong word. She gives it the go, and then we do a public comment period. So at that point in time, if the community would like, we can do a very detailed public meeting on, you know, much more detailed than this. The community does not have to have that, but the community has the option to, to publicly comment on that for 30 days. Um, the rub here is you have contamination. So even if you don't redevelop, redevelop the playground area, you have to do something about it. So it's not like you can just take a pass. OK, next stage, next step. So this is a step of a slides that I'm just going to talk about a little bit. And I'm going to be honest with you, this is a little bit outside of my reach. This is the state program. And I'm just stepping in here for Linda. So um, I'm just going to do my best. And, and we can go back again. And when Linda's on vacation, we can, we can revisit this. But there is a program called Brella, which is Brown Use, Brownfields Reuse Environmental Liability Limitation Protection Program. And basically, this is saying, OK, um, you own a contaminated property. And the city, in this case, is a responsible party. Correct, that's the terminology. You own the property since many, many moons ago. Um, but you are allowed to sell that said property in theory. And this is not just specific to um, the park. This is just in general, any property. Um, you can sell that property, and the person who purchases that is kind of out of the chain of liability, right? Because if you want to flip that to somebody else, say you have milk and you want to sell the mill, you can sell the mill, and the person who purchases it is not responsible for the cleanup. And it gets you out of it. There's a whole program. It's broken. So it's a little, bit of, um, a little bit of a way to get some properties cleaned up. And, and we'll see why next. 
So the next phase is, if you want to apply, next slide, Laura. If we want to apply for state or brownfields cleanup funding, again, a competitive process, you need to be in the Brella program, and you cannot be a responsible party. So that limits the city's options as a responsible party. There are a couple of workarounds, and we can talk about that a little bit. And these are just throwing things up in the air to try to get some funding. Or the city can come up with $300,000 of funding. <coughs> you know, it's just trying to come up with some ideas. Uh, like I said, so there's state funding um, from Vermont ACCD, very similar to what I think you were chatting with, Karen. And then we have competitive cleanup grants. For example, uh, the St. Johnsbury Armory right now has a cleanup grant from EPA. So there are several options. Um, and, and that, okay. So how do we get to the cleanup of DU1? So like I said, the city of Newport is not eligible to roll in the Brella program because you are a responsible party. Um, the city is not eligible to apply for state or brownfields cleanup funds because you are a responsible party. And I gotta be honest with you, I think the Brella statute was written for um, not necessarily municipalities, right? You're not the bad guys. It was written for the more corporate polluters, but there's no exemption or anything for municipalities under Brella. It's a responsible party, it's a responsible party. No matter if you're a mom and pop, no matter if you're DuPont, or no matter if you're Newport. Um, there are some workarounds to get cleanup funds um, where a third party can come in and uh, take ownership of the playground area, in theory, apply for cleanup funds, and then either do something with it. <laughs> um, and that would be something they would continue to own the playground, or the, the, the one parcel. They could transfer it to another entity, or you could broker a long-term lease. This has been used um, a couple of times for a uh, library cleanups, believe it or not where like the friends of the library had taken over a building and cleaned, you know, gotten the necessary state and federal grants, cleaned the building, and then the friends of the library operate the building even though it's really the library for the town. We've done that in Berwick, Maine. So there's just some creative examples out there that might apply. Um, just things to think about. Again, I'm not an ex umbrella but that might be a consultation to have with the state to see what options are available to the city um, okay so next so, go back. <laughs> yeah, I knew you weren't gonna let me get away with no. that one. <laughs> um, so if the city by chance turned it over to a third party it can never come back to the city is that what the bottom paragraph see that word there the Vermont environmental current policy it's a policy. So that's something you can have a conversation about. Yeah. I am not from Vermont DEC. No, no. Okay, that's <laughs> that caught my eye right there. Yes. We basically giving up a, a piece of property in the middle of the city. I'm gonna pick on NVDA for example. Suppose we did turn it over to Dave and NVDA. Right. But what's the guarantee in 40 years, 30 years, they don't go out of business, then what would happen? That's the that's a question probably for the experts, but that's in the back of my mind, you know, because it's something that you got to think about long term. Right. If we turn over to any third party, what happens when they go away? Or you have a hundred and twenty-five year lease, right? There's all kinds of. I'm not a lawyer. No, no I know you can have leases, but it's just <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. So I'm not a lawyer. I'm just saying these are just things to think about, and I'm only throwing them out there because that's a pretty big lift for a town or a city to do, wanting to still get the playground, right? So just trying to to throw some ideas out there. Um, the next slide, and this slide was. Excuse me. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, are there any uh, legislative proposals to change uh, some of the criteria, such as allowing the city to be eligible uh, to enroll in Brella or uh, allow the city to uh, receive um, federal or state funding? Yes. Um, again, I work for the feds. I'm an engineer. I do the technical stuff. I do not believe so, but that is a conversation to have with Vermont DEC and Linda Preventure in the context of the corrective action plan. Yeah, but I, I yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I just have a question. So I just 
Did I hear correctly that it's a competitive grant for the Brownfields for the Brella program? So the federal grants are competitive. Right. Um, ACCD grants are competitive. Dave, you might have a, we are in an unprecedented time of funding yeah. for, for Brownfields grants right now. And they are still competitive as far as I know, Dave. Yeah, there's a lot of money in Brownfield right now, both through the Agency of Commerce and through the Department of Environmental Conservation. So probably more than we've ever seen. Yeah. So it's a good time to have this problem, I guess, is what we're saying. <laughs> there's always a silver lining to say. Um, so, so chances are good that we would get the money because there seems to be money floating out there. If perchance the ground it didn't come through, for some reason there were so many applicants that the court didn't get it, we would just have to revisit this all again, right? We would, because then we wouldn't be able, we'd have to get, well, we couldn't get our property back because we turned it over. Well, it, again, yeah, I'm not a lawyer, legal. Yeah. you know, it's all legal yeah. things, there's many machinations yeah. here, yeah. Okay. so, yes. I'm projecting out yes. to things that may not ever happen. Right, right, okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so you have a to-do, I think, is what I'm hearing here, that it is, like I said, I'm, I'm just a federal cleanup telling you, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not mean to Google you. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, that's, that's why I'm here, and that's why I wanted to come in person, because it's so much easier to do this in person yes. than to do it on that. Um, and uh, like I said, I really do want to support the, the folks who have been trying so hard to make this happen. Um, so this was actually supplied to me by, um, oh, please forgive me, the chairman of the rec department. Uh, our, 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 our attorney, we're, uh, the city of Newport provided that. Yes. That came from our rec department. Yes, and so this is from Laura. Yeah. Um, and it basically shows how committed the city is to fundraising for the park. Um, they've already raised $484,000 for the park redevelopment. Um, and this is the funding that started the whole conversation down here. Um, uh, some, some state and federal grant funds, block grant funds. And um, I can't remember the other, LWCF? Night and Water Conservation Fund. Thank you. The National Park Service. It has to parks and recreation very well. So that's the, that's the funding right there, uh, about $270,000, um, corporate sponsors, uh, about 138,000 in kind labor. Gates Electric, kudos to them, 10 grand. Um, fundraising for the community, about $30,000. A difference of fund fund me, another $12,000 from the community, and then donor bricks, another 12,000. So they really have raised quite a bit of. Um, and I will tell you, as far as competitive grants go for the feds, when we see this kind of dollars, is why we want to get involved. Right? It's why we put TBA funds on, it's why we supported an assessment of the property, because you really see the community wanting to make something happen. In we, we care about leverage funds. So if I put in $100,000 of assessment funds, this shows me that my $100,000 was worth it. Uh, next slide. So this is next steps. This was just Laura and I kind of brainstorming on, on what you, what possibly, well what has to be done by process. So like I said, the corrective action plan just came out a couple weeks ago um, for playground redevelopment. EPA and, and Vermont DEC are reviewing it now. To be honest, Linda gives it the final approval because that's the way the program works in the state. Different states have different ways of doing that. Um, once she gives it the review, they can go out for formal public notice. We notify the abutters uh, of the property and we held a 30-day public comment period. And like I said, we can do a much more in-depth public meeting if that is something the community desires. Um, and then the big 64, well, more than $64,000 question, right? How to secure cleanup funds to implement the corrective action plan. So I just wanted to say it's been a pleasure working with the community, supporting you, and I hope that we can continue to make your playground a reality. Questions? I want to thank you for coming because I thought it was, I just, I know it had been delayed, but I was probably one of the more impatient people, for most likely, because because I just felt the public, we kept getting asked, some of us kept getting asked a lot of questions. You know, there's been a lot of totally questions about, about why the delay in the splash pad, why the delay in the playground, what's happening with all the money that was raised, you and know, we, and, and, we know. and we didn't have answers, and this has been very helpful to be able to say, I could re reference this if someone asked me a question, or tell people we had to go to look at the documents, and so I found this very helpful this evening, and I really, really appreciate you coming. No, my pleasure. And like I said, we did have a lot of delays because of COVID, 
And then Josh on the phone has a very new and very early born daughter. Um, so that was also one of our delays on our side. So that's also why Josh is not here. Congratulations. He's got a newborn at home that came too new. Too early. <laughs> Unexpectedly early. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I've got a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sure. Chris, oh, Chris go. Oh. Um, Miss May, I'd like to have a, co a printed copy of that packet, and then I'd like to have your card if you have one. I do not have a card, which I realized was a, a mistake up here, but I can um, just write it down for you right now. You do it, please. Yeah. yeah. And um, yes, so my name is Chris Feeling. I work for the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. Everything I do is public information. I'd be happy to follow up with anybody. Um, email is always a little bit easier, but we can talk to you. And, um, well, can you, can you send that tonight? Because I have to go out of town for a Johnson Pond in the morning, so I won't. So I'm going to be working on this tonight, tentatively. Yeah. Would you like to send one to you, too? Sure. It's on the website. It will be um, with the minutes, but I'll, I'll send it to both of you so you don't have that public. Yes. Jim, so, did you have something? It was a pleasure. Ooh. Yeah, Chris, you said no digging on the other three sections. I mean, those are well, ball fields. They have to be maintained. They just can't let them grow over with grass. Somebody may want to put lights in there. They got to dig. So I think if that is comes up, you just have to. We have to. The, the city would have to work with the state. Um, and basically, what I think will happen is there'll be some type of soil management plan, which is already proposed in the, in the corrective action plan, that you would just have to follow for the other areas as well. You know. Yeah, but the plan would be different for. It might be. Two, but three, it, and four than it is for one. Correct, but it would it would it, there will have to be some thought, I guess, before you do a but you know. And I'm not talking well, about. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a depth limitation. You can't go. I was going to say I don't think I'm not talking about maintenance on the top or your 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 groundskeeping. We're talking, you know. We did this. The upper soil was zero to six was tested, and that came out clean. So that's to me. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So basically, your ball fields are cleared for current use. Um, you know, the, the soil zero to eighteen inches uh, came back clean. So in that way, that, that's the uh, interval that the that Vermont DC considers surface soil in the state of Vermont. So each state has a defined surface soil a little, a little bit different. But in Vermont, it's zero to eighteen inches. That's what we stand for past those those deep years that that were presented and. Um, for the ball fields, they all came back uh, below any of the actual Vermont total standards. So, you know, they're, they're as far as Vermont's concerned, clean. Um, right. So, in that zero to 18 depth interval, that doesn't mean that it, we have over there that shows that there's stuff below that 18 inches. That's, that's where the soil management comes into place. But if, if there's going to be any sort of work in that subsurface below 18 inches, um, you know, that, that's something we'll have to contemplate those soils. So we're good to resurface a field if it has to be down yes. to six inches or something. You don't need to exactly. have to jump through a hoop for that. No. All right, that's what I'm getting at. No. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was thinking more like trenching, piping, you know, okay. or, or potentially if you do a lecture. Sounds know. like Josh said you go down 18 inches. Yes. Yep. Okay. Oh, I Okay, I, I, saw, I saw her then. Okay, go ahead. If we were just talking about playground equipment, then that wouldn't be a problem. So the issue is more because of the splash pad area. It's the infrastructure below, yes. So it would be but anything that went down. Like so, so footings for playground equipment would also be probably okay. impacted. Any <coughs> sauna tubes or any kind of footings that you had to put in. Uh, any had piping for the splash pad, yeah. So, yeah. And then also failed in the service of the next yeah. Well, it's kind of stated that the arsenic issue is a very eighteen inches. That, that is another um, component the issue with the playground area specifically. And um, why the, the presented alternative is, is that barrier and then adding clean soil on top. That, that gives you a uh, contact barrier so that people are not coming in contact with that soil. Yeah, that one playground area happened to be hotter than the others. So is it okay for people to be on the playground surface playing? So we point? have talked about that with the state. Um, it is it is not ideal, but I know the community has put in some additional bark mulch on any of the, the real dirt part. You don't really have to worry about grass, right? It's not so much the grass, it's the dirt. So the dirt part, I believe Tom has put additional 
uh, bar. Oh, are you Tom? Yes, Tom. Right. See, Tom I've never, right. I've never met Tom yeah, in person. Tom right so I will tell you, I only see Tom at this size when I see him. <laughs> so I apologize, Tom, that I didn't put that together. So yes, why don't you talk about what we talked about with the additional bark mulch? Yeah, we most, most of the stuff in the playground area had, had been removed anyways. Um, so the, the area mostly where the kids were playing has a, uh, a depth of mulch, uh, not mulch, but chips, wood chips. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. So that's an interim solution. I, I don't think the state will buy that. Again, I'm speaking secondhand. They will buy it long term. Correct. Okay. Yeah, but and the grass areas are, are um, okay. Right, thanks. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so do I understand correctly that if the city were able to raise, you know, the 300000 or not quite, then you could retain ownership of the park and not have to transfer? Well, just, again, that's just an option. Mm -hmm. But that is another option. Yes. Mm -hmm. If the city raised the funding, yes. So we were just throwing out some options. Just have to, yeah. The money just has to yeah. come from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I'm still not clear. Is it okay for children to play in the playground now? I mean, I, I don't even know. Did we remove the swings or something? No. Like I said, there is the the, it is, the issue is contact. You know, dermal contact or eating the soils. So the grass area is fine, and we did put additional. We recommended that the city put additional wood chips up there. I actually went there today, and there's quite a bit of wood chips on the dirt surfaces. So for the interim, till we kind of figure out where to go, that would be um, the best course of action. So children can go and play yes. and go on the swings and whatever is there. Thank you. Kids have been going there and playing for 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of problems. <laughs> I had years from now, who knows? Anyway, thank you so much. It was really nice oh, to meet you all. One, one oh. quick question. I'm not sure if you can answer it. Does a whole park have to be transferred to another entity or just the playground area? So that is another legal question I, I am not sure of. And there's also issues with the grant funding and who owns the parcels. So there's a lot of legal questions that you have to, and that's definitely one of them. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think if that were considered to be a revolution, I don't think the voters would ever go for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that option. There's another option. There's an option. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's moving on. Item number six. Purple Heart City signage. Um, I had put out an email with pictures of potential signs to the council to consider. Um, since we are a, we are the first Purple Heart community in the uh, state of Vermont. Um, after the Purple Heart ceremony two Sundays ago, um, the commander of the VFW, um, Robert Bernier, approached me and said that he had actually ordered two signs. But he's not sure of the quality. So. Well, here they are. Oh. You see the quality. Oh, you have them? Yeah. Oh, we did get them in time. They're aluminum. Hmm? They're aluminum. They're roadworthy. So, oh, well. We, so we actually have two signs, because that was my proposal. And so this is kind of a, a move right. point now on the agenda, but he had. Oh, we need two more. You should order two more because the other entrances. So we would want to order two additional ones. Um, but those are nice. Yeah. Paul and I had discussed that and wondered if we needed to have a purple background, but I think it shows up better on the green. It does. We like the green. And so we'll want to order two more. I guess we could have him order it and reimburse. And so we could, my thought was to put them up on the entrance from Coventry. Coventry Road, there's a welcome sign there. Coming in on 105 um, and coming in by the ledges. And then we thought Sias Avenue. Those are the four main entrances to the city. So. Mr. Mayor, do you know where the, uh, where the sign is? I do not. 
Um, uh, Dr. Robert Bernier, the commander of the VFE order. He got him somewhere. I'm just curious I think it's about standard things. size that they're, they're putting up around uh, the country, or it just seems kind of small, like 25, 35 miles an hour to pass them. Just a thought. All it says here is arrowheadiowa.com, made in the USA by veterans. I think Robert can tell you where he got. Yeah. So we'll want to contact him um, to order two more. Those look like a standard, a standard size. Like. Well, I'll, I'll contact him. I've got him on email. Okay, if you could contact him, that would be great. Okay. Who was depicted on that sign? George Washington. Do you think that there could be um, the same sign put up, but maybe without his picture? No, there no, may no. Be it is a requirement. That is the Purple Heart that is, was given out in 1700s originally, and now is given out in modern times. That is the actual Purple Heart that is given out. We cannot modify that. That's the all. original design passed by Congress way yes. back in the Revolution. Good try. It, it may raise issues down the line. Mm -hmm. I will not, not raise an issue. It's the actual metal. It's, it's the, actual the actual metal. metal. Yeah. That men and women who, who die for that country, for our freedom, receive. Yeah, I, I have no objection to the concept of the purple part in the middle. It just may uh, raise other issues one of these days. It, it wouldn't come to us if it was coming from the federal level down. Right. <clears throat> okay. Okay, moving on. Yes, we don't need a vote for one or two more. I don't just think so. I mean, unless you want to do it for formality's sake, but we're, yeah, we're, I took let's just, uh, let's just, yeah, let's, let's just take a motion. That way we'll have it in the record. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll move to purchase two purple heart signs to put up in addition to the two that were bought by the, um, VFW. By the VFW. Motion made by Ms. Patterson. Is there a second? Okay. Second by Mr. Charbonneau. Discussion? And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. The next item is a water meter status and authorization to apply for a USDA uh, grant loan program. Um, I had asked back in July for a status of how many meters had been installed, how many were left to install. Um, and my thought process was back when we voted to mandate water meters because of potential funding for the water tower, um, we never put an end date. It's an open-ended date. So in theory, you can't really, yeah, you might have mandated water meters, but we don't have a date. So someone could say, oh, what's the end date? There isn't any. Well, then don't come to my house. <laughs> and so that is why, that is why I asked for an update um, I guess I was a little surprised to see applying for a USDA grant, but if that is well, something that will help us implement it, because I know yeah. she put a, you put, if they could potentially all be installed by 2025? That would be best case scenario, and that's talking to Wayne Elliott and learning. I talked to the USDA as well about the process. So that's, um, that's putting a whole bunch of, of process into place. Uh, you also have to go through procurement and then once you have your procurement, it's really up to the grant criteria and the contractor, you know, because you would hire a third-party contractor to do the installations. So there are some unknowns, and um, I wasn't sure how to proceed or how to take uh, the energy, and, and uh, it seemed like it was best to go for a grant and see what we might come up with. We'll all know more. And that way, we can keep our finger on the pulse and keep moving this forward. I just still think we need to put an end date, whether we apply for a grant or not, whether it's three years, like what you said with the USDA. 
or yeah. we do six years, you know, something. Yeah. We have to put an end date because people, I actually was chatting downstairs with um, Stacy and Robin, who's, yeah. and they've had people say, they've asked them about, you know, meet or whatever, and they said, oh, well, there's no end date, so we don't have to really worry about ever having one in stock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really need to yeah. put some teeth into it, in my opinion, just to uh, give a little incentive. Because I think, as Tom said at one meeting, you're kind of running out of people volunteering. Oh, yes, you know, absolutely. yeah, right, and that's why yeah. I... We, we don't have, uh, you know, we have addresses of people, but we don't have phone numbers. So, you know, it's a process for us to go hang a flyer on the door and, and hope they call you. Um, so, unless we incentivize it, or right. in a way force people to call us, it, it's, it's going to be a battle. Right. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, the other thing to keep in mind too is, you know, uh, the three main crew we had at the wastewater plant were the ones putting them in. They did a very good job the last few years. That's above and beyond their normal routines of, of work. So, you know, that's still quite a few meters that need to be Because right now, according to this, 826 need to be metered. And out of that 826, I'm assuming there's probably a few that can't be needed, or a be a, a, that are, I know some spots, so that's where, that's where we're gonna have to think about our rate structure too, because there are some sections, I'm thinking along the lake, where the pipes are above the ground, and only for summer people. Right. So those, those places will never be able to be needed. I'm told by one of my neighbors, she called a long time ago to have done and no one has showed up. On Duchess Street. Well, we'll take a look because our records are showing that we're right up to date. So I'm interested. I'm just one about what she told me. Yeah. Do you know how long ago? What's that? Do you know how long ago? Congress threatened me? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I just put yeah. it on a bunch of five okay. motions. The only reason I ask is that I agree. Our wastewater plant operator mm -hmm. had resigned last, yeah. so any, any contacts that he had prior to that kind of get put on the background. Okay. It was it was Davio's house. Can we break out now? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Blind to that. What's that? Can we blind to that? Okay. okay. I, I don't. I'll look it up. I'll look so, it up. So um, <laughs> that was the kind of like the yeah. theory behind what I was well, thinking. I, we need. You need some teeth sometimes. I think that's very good thinking, um, but if, it, if it's okay, let me do a little more research on this uh, and find out what the grant um, requires. Because we're going to have to get with our engineer as well. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I, think, I think we can come back with something that's in alignment with what the funding source will allow. Well, the city's mandated that they're going to have to do it for that. Right. Like, right or not. Right. It's just a, it's a very big undertaking. That's all. So, it's up to you. Can I have another question? One second. Okay. Um, when do you think you can come back to the council? Um, I can get an appointment with uh, the USD rate uh, rep. I can ask her for an appointment and I can try to come back at our next meeting because that's three weeks away. It's gonna, uh, and I'll keep you posted so we can target that. Okay, because I'd like to have it resolved by probably October if we could have a date. I really think we need to put an end date. All right. So we, I'm sorry, Mr. Pill. Go ahead. So we actually have two different issues. Two different issues here. We have, we now know that there's grant money available that we didn't know in the past. Yeah. Well, so the grant money, um, the second page of this. This is the um, this is from the presentation that Wayne Elliott gave us right. when we were going for the water tower. So the grant money uh, this was incorporated into the total package of the water towers. <coughs> USDA um, is interested in learning more about this for possible funding up from meters, just the meter portion. So recall when we had started with the original uh, free water meter program mm -hmm. 
And then uh, when the council mandated meters, it was our hope that if we could install as many as possible on our done, it would make the total price lower. Mm -hmm. So that's been our emphasis. But I wanted to remind folks that uh, back then, of course it was 200 meters more back then, it was a million thirty-four thousand. And this does consider that there'll be a, cer a certain percentage of complex ones, as you mentioned, but it also considers that it would be a third party contractor that would be doing the work. So again, I see it as two different issues. I see it as proceeding with trying to get a grant to do it as issue number one, or, you know, action item one first. And then also the second, the second item, which is separate from the grant, asking for the grant, is to put an end date on meters. So if we said, um, so if this is, you know, if it's 2025 is in here with a, with a grant and somebody, a third party doing it, you know, that seems reasonable. It doesn't, 2025 doesn't appear to be workable if we have to do it with our staff. So if we put an end date that was further out, if we get the grant, we get it done earlier before our end date, but we have an end date in place in case we have to do it ourselves. So, so I see it as two different things. It could be. Um, I just want to ask, once you have your end date, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Does that mean that you adjust the rates uh, differently or how, how does it, what's the next step after an end date? I mean, well, an end date is so that, as has been said numerous times, an end date is to give you incentive and a reason to get yourself metered. Because right now there's no end date, so you just say, I'll do it next year, I'll do it next year, I'll do it next year. So that, I think we've talked about that here several times, that that's the reason to put an end date in. Um, does that mean so, that, um, just one more question, so does that mean a, a change in the rates and fees so that those who are not metered by the end date have a, have a different incentive through the rates and fees? So now you're talking rates and fees and restructuring, because we were talking about restructuring at one point, and we had the big push at the beginning of this year to put in a new rate structure. But this memo says that we need to look at it for after we've had that for four well, five years. Well, I'm, I'm so. talking about incentivizing. So, no, it's an open-ended question. So does once you have an end date, mm -hmm. is the incentive that your users can expect that if they don't have their meter installed by then, that they're going to have a different rate Probably. than those who are not? Yeah, I would okay. think. I mean, I can't make that decision myself. No, right. Right. But that's the council's direction. Decision. That would be a direction to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But again, we can't make that decision. That helps. Two different rates now. You need a rate or not? You don't need a rate, right? We're that's operating, so different. We're operating on two rates now. Yeah. yeah. So the end well, rate. I don't see the problem. Yeah. Is there a third party in mind if we're going that route? Would that, have would to go a, that would be a procurement process that USDA would require. We'd have to get three grants. And I know um, one of our neighboring municipalities used one pre-COVID we were very happy with, but we'd have to put out a full procurement. And just one other thing about there are few contractors that have installation resources. And is, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean they don't have the knowledge to do it? They don't have the equipment or they don't have the personnel? Um, I think it's a very specialized thing. So when we put out a procurement, it'll be throughout the mandate. So if we do them ourselves, it's not specialized, but it's specialized if a licensed plumber does it. Essentially, yes. Okay. Yes. So, so any local licensed plumber is not disqualified. Correct. Okay. Okay. I just didn't quite get the specialized for one but not the other. So. I guess we have have to have more information for the next meeting. Happy to do that. You know, we can put off the vote. But, but, but at the next meeting, I want to have a vote on an end date. I really feel strongly that we need to have an end date. And, and again, I mean, talk about it at the next meeting, but I don't have a problem with extending the time, uh, you know, beyond 2025. Oh, okay. 
I have an issue making it longer. Oh, okay. If we get a grant, we get it done sooner, that's great, but we need to allow the flexibility for if we have to do it ourselves, the time to do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I, I had thought of an end date out beyond what, what the city manager had put here based on some preliminary rough math yeah. idea. And um, I think my end date was out to, let's see, that's 2025, that was three years. I think I went out actually another three years. That's what I had done. I had put an end date of 2028, is what I had thought in my mind based upon an average of doing so many a month times 12 months and then figuring, you know, it was just some rough math based upon looking at what's been installed and figuring what could be installed. Um, so, you had a question. I just want to make sure I fully understand. So right now, there are employees installing the meters, and that's costing just their their hours. But then there's funding available from USDA that would pay somebody else, and that's in the million dollar range um, that would pay for the installation. So that is there an issue with the city with the employees not? Do they not want to continue, or is it it's uh, above and beyond? Time, 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 time and staffing. Time and staff. You know, they do them as they can, and they do the job. I mean, I've had no problem with my meter, so I think they do a good job. Um, so it's, it's staffing and time. Hi. When Tammy called, she said, my neighbor wants his done, which is my poodle. Well, he needs to call Mr. Bernie here. Well, they did. Tammy did. Well, but she can't say for the neighbor. Oh. He needs to call directly. Anybody who wants a meter needs to call directly. They can't tell the other neighbor to oh, call okay. on their behalf. That's fine. Yeah. That's okay. That's good. Good. Okay, thank you. Good. I mean, we could have a vote on a date if we wanted to tonight. There's nothing that says we, you know. I think it would have to be longer than the three years because we don't know if you're going to get the, the, the grant. It's probably competitive, right, Laura? Yeah. So you don't, you're not guaranteed of getting it. So you don't, you don't want to box in the public works department and say you're going to have this done in three years because we know that's not realistic, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we'll we'll plan on next next, next meeting. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. We'll plan on next meeting. Do we need to vote to have a to have a word? We could vote. Um, I'm going to do it. She okay. can just proceed. Okay. We could just, I mean, we could vote to table that until the next meeting. We probably should say Yes. So we need to table it. But Mr. Page, or Representative Page, had it. Yes. I'm just curious, that million dollar grant, is the city eligible to take that money and install um, those water meters themselves? No. 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 You have, to, yeah. you have to give it to an outside group. Yeah. You have to give it to somebody licensed, right? License, yeah, that's right. License you, have to do it. you give it to a third party, they make arrangements to contact the people, they make the appointment, mm -hmm. they do, um, they do the project. They do the entire project. Thing. It would be, that's the way to go. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a motion yes. to table item seven. So I will move to uh, table item seven, the authorization to apply for USDA grant loan program. Um, to the next scheduled council meeting. Motion be made. Is there a second? I'll second. Made by Ms. Pedersen, second by Mr. Wilson. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion to Okay. Uh, item number eight, we're moving on to new business. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I've got a itinerant vendor application here. A young lady is a college student who wants to go around and sell children's educational books for seven days. Like go around door to door? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't carry the books. Mm -hmm. 
college students are somewhere over there. Is that, do we, I'm not, I guess I'm not really sure. I always think the vendor license is like having a booth set someplace. Because I don't think we can authorize somebody to go knocking on doors. I don't think we uh, need a, I don't need a I mean, we had an encyclopedia salesman for years ago. Okay. I guess that was before my session, time. But not session, but pressing. Did they have, a, did they get a vendor's license to do that? Yeah. Encycl no, it's not encyclopedia guys did? Well, they must have before my time, but they, <laughs> 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 these things have been around for a long, long time. Okay. The Philip Rushman. So, we need a motion. I don't think you're going to be any danger. I think you're only about 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make a motion. Mr. Vashon makes the motion to approve the vendor's permit. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Charbonneau. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. <laughs> Any other new business? Mr. Right. Mayor. Do we have the contact for this person so we can put something out? Yeah. That's a good idea to let got people number know and that maybe card. I'll grab it from you. You'll have to be good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Somebody will call and see. Something. No, Mr. Wilson, they're not selling that. You do it or do it yet. No, that's really the main firm. I just have a question. Um, have you said you've had a strange birthday for every year, Jay, Amway, um, Avon, or anybody else that you've Selling stuff. They've been Mary Kay do it anyway. They've been going door to door for years. Oh, I know. They've been doing that for all of a sudden issuing permits. It's right. It's setting kind of a precedent here. They all have to have permits to do it. Well, they probably should have had. They probably didn't. This one applied for a permit. We're approving the permit. Because technically, if we don't approve it, then you know, he brought it to us to approve, and if we don't approve it, then technically, she's not allowed to go door to door. This is a transient merchant and itinerant vendor permit. That's exactly what it is. Transient. My question would be, as a recipient, would a person, does a person have to pay at that moment? Do you get your book at that moment? Is she carrying the books with her? Or do you have to give over credit card information, check information? I no what, I mean, what exchange is required at the door when you encounter this person? Yeah, and what are we setting ourselves up for? It's, I guess my main question. I have no idea. City vendor. I, I'm an authorized city vendor. I have the city's permission to come and knock on your door. I, I just raised that as someone who doesn't want people coming to my door. Well, to me, it's like the full brush man. You don't want to see him run when they knock on the door. <laughs> I like the go get itness. I'm just not sure that's the process, but because I, again, I don't, you know, I'm not quite sure about it. You know, people knock on my door to sell me wheeze and Girl Scout cookies. And well, I, I get yeah, I get knocked on the door for Girl Scout cookies. I get Christmas wreaths. Mm -hmm. I think you're set. I don't think they are, John, but people have been going door to door selling stuff for years and years and still they doing it. Mm -hmm. They have and they do, but now you're city authorized. That's why you have the permit process. That's why these people decide it. <laughs> I look at it, the person at least filled out a permit application instead of just trying to knock on doors. At least we have something. Now the chief can tell, put out something that you might have. Enjoyed. That's what you guys said up there. You know. <laughs> if you raise the question, you make the decision. Yeah, I don't care, but I'm not going to be buying any kids' books. My kids are all grown up now, so I don't need any kids. No. But I guess my question pointed to you, is that information on the application, like the process at the door, it would be good to know whether, not just knocking on the door and selling, but what is the format there? Because I think the we just on this carries is the same format for any vendor in the city of same thing for a moment. But it's, if I could make one more comment, 
okay. yeah. a vendor a vendor on Main Street is different than a vendor on my own property. And so that's the only thing a vendor on, in public space is different than a vendor saying, I'm city authorized coming on my property to sell me something. That's where I see the distinction. It's an unauthorized, unwarranted person. Maybe I'll call the post office and tell them, don't deliver any bills to my house out of one shelter. <laughs> <laughs> well, the benefit is that the contact information will be with the, the police. So if there are any questions or problems, We'll have the contact information and the copy of that. I mean, you can always make it contingent on whatever Travis finds out. I'm just presenting things. You guys decide what you yeah. want to do. Western Advantage Sales Representative. I don't know. Going to this an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau on her card, but anyway, put that on. Recreation director is here. I would, I, is, is the calendar for the city when you reserve things working all right? Because I was informed that we lost a couple of softball tournaments because the field appeared to be booked. It was booked, and it was never they never canceled the reservation. So we did have a reservation that came in. I mean, all that I'm going to say it predates me. It was on the calendar. So do we? But they never canceled. It was a it was a June tournament. Yeah. So the, the system. Oh, okay. But is there a way we can follow up? 
I did. Before, like, the event, just to confirm again, because, you know, I'm getting at it as I hate, I hate us potentially losing softball tournaments because it's a, it brings a lot of money in for the businesses you know, in town, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we don't lose tournaments because the calendar, you know, being booked or when it's not really booked. You know? yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really agree with you. And I did, I mean, I had no historical knowledge of that tournament, so I didn't know. And I did follow up with the group that was going to book that weekend to see if we could get them. So I've already reached out to them to try okay. to get next year. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because yeah. I, I had someone stop me and, and fill me in about it. And they were concerned also that we would potentially lose future tournaments and we know what it, how it helps all the local businesses. Okay. Um, I guess that's all I have on the new business. New business? No, no new business. No, thank you. Anything new? I just want to um, uh, let folks know about the barbecue and badge. That's this week? Yeah. The 18th, if you don't know. <clears throat> yeah, so Thursday the 18th, uh, Garden Park, we're doing the same thing we did last year, just the community outreach. Um, hot dogs, hamburgers, helicopters supposed to be coming. We're going to be doing canine demos again. Uh, we'll have special team equipment there from <coughs> state police, Border Patrol, Customs, Sheriffs, uh, and us. So just kind of bring your family down and hang out and check things out. You know, it's nothing crazy from 4 to 7. What? Is it officially called? Barbecue with a badge. Barbecue with a badge. With a no, barbecue with a badge. Barbecue and bad. Barbecue oh, with the bad. <laughs> it's on our Facebook page. I've shared it on there. It's on the marquee. Um, so. Barbecue with the bad. Yep. Okay. Okay. Anything else? No, thank you. Okay. Old business? No. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Wilson? Yeah, I brought mine up. And all that could have been either. Have we started moving forward on the reservoir and the liner and the cover? We, that, we voted that's, on uh, that's in Wayne's, our engineer's hands. Okay. So um, he's got the yes vote, and we probably won't hear anything for a little while. But yes, it essentially okay, we've gone for Yeah. That's all I have. <laughs> I don't have any of this. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I just want to let folks know on the um, public hearings for the municipal plan, I have announced dates that have since changed, so I want to uh, just bring folks up to date that the Planning Commission meets tomorrow night. They're expected to vote on moving the plan over to the City Council, uh, and you have the draft in front of you. At that point, that starts the clock ticking. The uh, public notice will go into the paper the 17th, so I'm expecting the first, uh, the first City Council public hearing to be on uh, September 19th and the second public hearing, which would be the final one on October 17th. And so there's no confusion. It will be at 6.30? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. All right. Any other old business? No, thank okay. you. Okay, the next regularly scheduled city council meeting will be Monday, September 12th. 6.30 p.m. here in the council. Thank you. And we need a motion to adjourn at 8.06.